How are we doing, Kyle? It, it, what what was it like in the in the building last night? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me on. Um, it was it was exactly what you would have hoped for for that type of game. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of storylines from last year's uh, national championship game, and there was a lot of hype coming into this game for it. Um, and the energy inside the arena was absolutely what you would expect. Um, Iowa fans traveled really well. I would say that that they probably had eighty percent, if not more than eighty percent, of the the fans there. So. Um, with Iowa winning the game, it was really loud for most of the night. Um, but, but the first half and, and really even the, the whole game certainly um, met the hype that, that was built up for it. Uh, just a fantastic first half. Both teams going back and forth, both teams making runs. Um, but, you know, this is this is kind of what we hoped for was, you know, a, a game that lived up to the hype, one that, that hasn't really happened for women's basketball in a while. Um, the game's growing like like it never has before. And you really needed a game to live up to the hype. You know, had I or LSU just blown the other out, um, I think people would have been disappointed. But, you know, back and forth game for the most part was was exactly what you hoped for, and that's exactly what they got. Well, and you need last year's game to make this year's game feel this special. It, it feels like it, if it doesn't work out, like if South Carolina beats Iowa in the semifinals and it's a South Carolina LSU final, we're not talking about this like this. The fact that there's the history and you have the Kim Mulkey storyline, you have Angel Reese all season being a, a story. It felt like everything came together. And then, you know, as you're watching it, because that first quarter, the pace of, of the first quarter was insane. As you're watching that, is it is it like hard to catch your breath? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I, I'm kind of used to it from watching Iowa so much. I mean, they love to go at that type of pace. But coming into the game, um, you know, if you would have told me that Iowa was going to hit five, five first quarter three-pointers. Um, LSU is a team that doesn't make a lot of threes. They came into the game just averaging four per game. So I would have thought that five threes from Iowa in the first quarter would have put them in a, in a pretty good lead. Um, but LSU, to their credit, hit a lot of shots early. I think they hit three first quarter threes. But, yeah, the, the first seven minutes of the game was just back and forth at an incredible pace. It didn't seem like anybody could miss a sh shot. Um, and then it settled down there towards the end of the first quarter. LSU really went on a run. I think it was 10-0 to end the first quarter. Um, but yeah, that, that first quarter, that first seven minutes was just an incredible pace. Um, and, and you knew, you knew for a little bit that it wasn't going to keep up at that because they were on track for something like 150 points at that point. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was a really entertaining first, you know, five, seven minutes of that game. When, when Reese got hurt, she, you know, she, I believe she, she goes up to defend, I think a Caitlin Clark layup and then gets knocked into the, the photographers and, and twists her ankle. How bad did it look, and, and how different did she look the rest of the game up close? Because it, it it looked like she she kind of got back to full speed, but then you look at the stat line afterward, and you're like, oh, okay, she was missing a lot of shots she probably would have made. Yeah, I was on the other end of the court, so I didn't really necessarily see it. She kind of went down near you know where the photographers were, where the band was, and she came hopping out, wasn't putting any weight on it right away, hopped over to the bench and sat down and – my initial first thought was that's game changing. You know, when you have a player like her that can, I mean, she finished with 20 rebounds. When you have someone that can do that um, and all of a sudden they're potentially limited, that certainly changes the game. Uh, she wasn't out for very long, came back in. I don't know if she got taped up, you know, tied her shoe tight or whatever she did. Um, but yeah, I, I think it certainly, you know, changed the way that she had to play, um, especially with this as athletic as she is, the way she is as a rebounder. Um, any type of pain in your ankle or foot or whatever it was. Um, that's harder for you to play, you know, that game, that, that jumping ability, uh, things like that are, are hurt when you, you hurt your ankle. Um, I think she shot like one of 10 uh, in the second half, something like that. She was able to get rebounds still. Um, you know, she didn't want to make any excuses of it in the post game. So you never really know how much it, it impacted her. Um, but I, I certainly believe that it impacted her. Um, you know, especially like I said, with the, with her athleticism, being able to jump, being able to do things at the rim, uh, Having an ankle injury certainly impacts that. And it's disappointing to see an injury like that um, impact a game that there was so much hype for. Yeah, because that feels like that was the biggest advantage that LSU had. Where, where you know, with Reese at full strength, they were more athletic in the post. It really felt, though, like Iowa's perimeter players, I mean, not just Caitlin Clark, but Gabby Marshall was tremendous defensively. Uh, the one play late in the game where, uh, LSU starts trying to set up their offense and she just jumps up and steals the, the, you know, the pass inside. And um, I thought Kate Martin had a couple big drives too, where it felt like 
that took pressure off Caitlin Clark to do everything where, you know, where they're, they're putting so many resources into defending Caitlin Clark. If Kate Martin can get a one-on-one -on -one matchup on the wing and drive and score, it, it felt like at that point, what's LSU going to do? Yeah. And, and when I was playing at their best, it's when those other players are, are, you know, hitting shots as well. When I would have a more spread out attack. I mean, I know Caitlin went for 41, but Kate Martin had 21 and, and so the Fulter had 16 and, and, you know, other players like Hannah Stolke. I know she was in foul trouble. Addie O'Grady did a really good job off the bench. Um, when those players are doing their role and, and, you know, hitting those shots when, when Caitlin can find them, that's when they're at their best. And you mentioned Gabby Marshall, not always a per person that's going to, you know, score 15 points in the game. She's a really good three point shooter when she gets going. Um, but the defense is, is where she, she's at her best. Um, she didn't come off the floor last night, played all 40 minutes and, and she was just, you know, she just puts her head down and grinds on the defensive end. Um, and she talks about, you know, she doesn't worry about how many points she scores. She knows that her job is to go out there and be a good defender. Um, you know, she talked recently actually about in high school, she was a scorer. Um, but she knew that with her size in college, defense was going to be where she was going to be able to get on the court. Um, and then, yeah, you see her, you know, that, pa that pass that she knocked down, that was, she just snagged that up there. That wasn't a deflection. That was anything like that. She just caught that ball in the air. Um, yeah, and it was she a, it took a charge a little bit. She did not take a charge a little bit later, I guess. That was, uh, I forget who took that charge. But um, she's made plays, you know, the last few games. Had a block against Nebraska in the Big Ten Tournament Championship. Had a block against West Virginia in the second round. Um, so she's been making plays on the defensive end like, recently. That was a – the the steal was was sort of the, the perimeter version of a stock. The the, the, the block steal. Because it, it wasn't a block because she was, she was pulling out a pass. But, yeah, the, they were shocked by that. Gabby Marshall's fun to watch on the offensive end, though, because – you could tell she feels like she has Caitlin Clark's range. And when she's moving without the ball, she's constantly demanding the ball <laughs> to shoot, even though there's just always somebody right there. So I, I, I wonder if, if that's kind of an inside joke among the players because she is, she's, you see her constantly saying, I'm open, I'm open. And Caitlin's like, I'm good. Yeah. And, and like I said, Gabby's a fantastic three point shooter. Early in the year, she struggled with, you know, hitting some shots at times, but when she gets going, I mean, she's, I mean, she, I wouldn't say she's just as good a shooter as Caitlin, but I mean, when she gets going, it's, she gets a lot of those transition threes and, and open threes. And when she gets going, she has a lot of fun with it. And, you know, a lot of players on this team can hit shots when, when they really get going. I mean, Kate Martin can hit shots as well. Um, you know, Taylor McCabe, someone that we didn't really see off the bench. She, I think she could potentially be the best three point shooter on the team. Um, so they have a lot of players that, that can hit those shots. And like I said, when I was at their best, it's when, when Caitlin can dish off to Gabby or dish off to Kate or even sit a full turn on the three point line and hit those shots. Um, I, I thought three point shooting coming into the game was one of the big things. Cause like I said, LSU isn't a team that's going to really fill it up from three point range. Uh, so I knew three pointers was an area where if Iowa could really outscore them in that category, that's where they were going to have the best chance to win. And, um, they outscored them. I think they made 13 and LSU only made eight. So, um, uh, a 15 point gap in there was, was what they were looking for. What was it like in the arena when Clark hit the behind the back step back? That's the one where Haley Von Lith just did the I, I can't do anything with this. What, what was the, the pop like in the arena when she hit that shot? I mean, it's, it's, it was just like what I've heard all season in Carver Hawkeye Arena. I mean, it was, it was really loud. Um, I think all the LSU fans were kind of thinking the same thing as Haley is I don't really know what to do at this point. I think Kim Mulkey was probably thinking the same thing. Um, but I mean, Iowa fans have, have just been incredible in the way they've traveled this year. And, um, you know, if that's a 50, 50 crowd, it's nothing like that. Um, it would have been loud for both sides, but yeah, when she was that, that early in that third quarter, um, she hit four or five of them in the first five minutes of the third quarter. Um, she was on another level, really locked in at that point. And that's when Iowa kind of took over the game is when she started hitting those shots. Um, but yeah, um, I, I've never had to defend Caitlin Clark, obviously, but I, I get that. I get what Haley Van Lith was that, uh, kind of that shoulder shrug. There's been a lot of times, you know, watching games throughout the season where she hits shots where I'm just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you would do as a defender. There's not much you can do in those situations. Yeah. You've seen that the frustration in a lot of different defenders eyes <laughs> throughout her career. Let's, let's hear from Kim Mulkey about the strategy or lack thereof for defending Caitlin Clark. Share with those well, there's not a whole lot of strategy. You got to guard her. Nobody else seems to be able to guard her. We didn't even guard her last year when we beat them. Um, she's just a generational player, and um, she just makes everybody around her better. That's what the great ones do. I think they had a kid that scored 21 and 18. She had 12 assists. 
Caitlin Clark's not going to beat you by herself. It's what she does to make those other teammates better that helps her score points and them score points to beat you. Um, what did I say to her? I said, I sure am glad you're leaving. <laughs> I said, girl, you something else. Never seen anything like it. And that that's really what it is. Nobody's seen anybody like this in, in the women's game. And Kyle, I, I'm curious, how much did the Iowa players want to beat this team that took the national title from them last year? Yeah, I think they actually did a really good job. I would say talking to them in the lead up to the game um, on on Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning is when we got to talk to them. They really kind of brushed it off as, "Hey, we're we're just trying to make another Final Four. Um, you know, I, we knew LSC was a possibility when the bracket came out, but they were really focused on the task at hand. Um, you know, but then they did kind of talk about it at times. Yeah, there is a little extra motivation when it's the team. You know, everybody works to make the national title game. They want to win a national title, and when you make it to that point, if you lose that and you get a chance to face that team again, of course there's going to be a little extra motivation. Um, but they talked a lot about not making the game more than it is. Um, you know, they weren't going to go in there and try to get chippy with them, talk, things like that. Um, they had the motivation to win the game, but ultimately when they stepped on the court, it was we're trying to make the Final Four for back-to-back -back seasons. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, there's extra motivation. When a team when a team cuts you short in the national title game from, from getting that ultimate goal and you get to face them again, yeah, of course, there's going to be motivation to to get them back, and that's what they did last night. I thought Caitlin Clark was interesting talking about the moment and the game and trying not to let the, the moment be bigger than the game itself because it, that one was, that situation with everybody's eyes on it could have been one where you do tighten up, but, uh, but Caitlin will let her explain it, but the, they did kind of keep the main thing the main thing. To be honest, like when you step on the court and you're a competitor, like – you don't feel that like you just you're there competing it's 5v5 like there could have been nobody in the gym and we would have both teams would have competed the exact same way and yeah you're playing for a little more with a final four on the line but to me like I'm not thinking like oh my god there's 15 million people at home watching this game right now like no like that's not what's happening it's like what can I do for my team to help me win this game win the game right now um that's what's going through your mind if you're too worried about everything else you're not going to be successful. You got to be completely locked in on, you know, what's happening between the lines. And I thought our team did a really good job of that. You know, it wasn't so and so made a bad call. It wasn't like, oh my God, they've made three shots in a row. It was all about us and what we need to do. And um, I think that's one of the reasons we won the game, honestly. It was it was pretty impressive the the way they locked in, and they've got to do this again. I, I mean, Kyle, if if they are to play for a national title. They have to get past the UConn didn't recruit Caitlin storyline and also UConn and Paige Beckers. And then South Carolina is probably sitting there on the other side. So how do they how do they keep this up as the stage gets bigger? Yeah, I think they just kind of keep doing what they've been doing. I mean, um, they, they knew coming in, especially with the way the bracket played out when they saw, you know, Colorado, who's a team that they played in the Sweet 16 the year before when they. They saw, you know, Kansas State was a potential one, a team they'd already lost to earlier in the year when they saw LSU. Um, they knew that they were going to have to beat good teams to, to make it to that ultimate goal again, which is to make it back to the national championship game. And they knew that it was going to be Connecticut or USC or maybe even Ohio State, a, a team that they had lost to. Um, but they, they kind of just talked about, you know, if you want to get to that ultimate goal, you're going to have to beat good teams. Um, and I think the good thing for women's basketball now is, you know, it used to be like a team like UConn, they'd make the tournament. And be well. We can just pencil in for the final four. Um, women's basketball is made to the point where the the players come out and they say, "Hey, it's not going to be easy to to win the second round game. It's not going to be easy to win the Sweet Sixteen game." Um, but I I was played in a lot of these games. They have the experience from last season, uh, making it to the final four, beating South Carolina. Um, so I th I think they're prepared for this. this is a, v a pretty veteran team, you know, with Gabby and Kate and Caitlin. Uh, they're they're the ones that have been there for a long time. They've been through a lot of tournament games. And this is a team that's won three straight Big Ten tournaments as well. So they, they've played in a lot of you know hostile and bat atmospheres. A lot of um, I mean, this whole season they've been playing in front of sold out crowds. So I think they're really ready for this moment. Um, there's there maybe is a little bit of a revenge factor. I know they didn't talk about it with the LSU game, but this is a team that knocked Caitlin and, and the Hawkeyes out in, in her freshman year in the Sweet Sixteen yeah. in the bubble. Um, you know, so and Paige Beckers was on that team. It was her freshman year. Um, so I think they're going to be motivated. They know that the, the, the task doesn't get any easier. I mean, you're in the final four now. It's the next level. 
Um, but they're just going to attack it the same way they did last season when they went and had to play South Carolina. So we haven't seen the ratings yet. I'm sure it's going to be a fairly big number for, for this LSU-Iowa game. But it feels like this is kind of a watershed moment in the sport. And Angel Reese got asked about that last night. And I, I thought her, her answer was really interesting. Um, I think it's just great for the sport, just being able to be a part of history. Um, like I said, no matter which way it went um, tonight, I know this is going to be a night for the ages. And just being able to part, be a part of history is great. Playing against another great player, of course, is always amazing in our viewership going up. And I'm sure so many different people watched us tonight. So I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to just keep raising women's sports, not just women ba women's basketball, but just women's sports in general. I mean, could you feel that in in the building? Because it, it certainly seemed like on social media, as you're watching, ES, I thought ESPN, and, and I didn't realize you were at the game, but I thought ESPN did a good job with the cinematography, for lack of a better word. Like, they made it feel huge. And did it feel that huge inside the building? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, um, you know, I was in there an hour and a half before the game started when fans started filing in, and it just kind of had that feeling of, you know, watching watching the two teams warm up. It was, this is, this is two really high level teams. We're about to see a really high level basketball game. Uh, you mentioned the talk on social media. I think in terms of, we talk about growing the women's game, this is the matchup that needed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, had LSU lost to, to M middle Tennessee. They, I mean, they could have very low, well lost and they're losing in the third quarter and, you know, had UCLA lost or something like that, it would have been different. You know, the viewership numbers wouldn't have been the same. Uh, so at a time right now where you're really trying to grow the women's game, this is the matchup that needed to happen. Um, the talk on social media was, was incredible. It seemed like every other tweet was was about the Iowa LSU game. And, and the, the energy inside the, the arena was certainly one that, that made you feel like, hey, this is going to be a huge game tonight. Um, I'm curious to see what the viewership numbers are. I know they, they was right around 10 million last year, peaked around 13. Um, I think it'll be similar to that. I'm, I'm really curious to see if they could potentially beat last year's game um, because it just seemed like, everybody was really excited to see this game and, and kind of different than we've ever seen for women's basketball before. Yeah. I, I would imagine that this will beat all of the men's tournament games so far. Now, maybe not the men's national champion. We'll see. I mean, it depends on what the men's national championship game is. You know, if it's UConn versus Purdue, I think that's going to be a pretty big number, but uh, we will see. And, and honestly, if it's Iowa, South Carolina in the women's national title game, we may see a bigger number there. So that's that's what's amazing to me is is how much Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and and you know all these different th these stars that have kind of come up organically through the women's game and then a lot of it is they're you know in the men's game you used to have guys that stayed three four years they became stars you're seeing that again because of NIL but the women's game has had the stars but I you brought it up earlier Kyle I think that you made the best point there are only really four or five good teams. Now there's probably 20 pretty good teams that can beat each other on a given day. That makes that tournament a lot more interesting. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And Caitlin actually just a, a, a few games ago talked about, she thought the round of 32 is, is becoming the toughest round of the tournament. And, um, you know, that's 32 teams at that point. I mean, I lost to Creighton a couple of years ago on their home floor in front of a sold out crowd. And then they had to battle Georgia to the wire last year when they made the national title game. And then this year, West Virginia gave them all they could handle. So it's it's not what it used to be where, you know, the one seed in the second round were still winning by 25, 30 points. I mean, you're running into a team that played like a top 25 team at, at times during the season. They just weren't as consistent. Um, so so I think the, the tournament has gotten to the point where, you know, out, outside of maybe that first game, uh, we don't really see the 15 over two upsets or the 14 over three upsets. But after that, I mean, every game is really hard to win. Um, and and it's it's really great to see the women's game get to that point um, where where every game feels like anyone can win. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's that's why women's basketball wasn't watched as much as it, it, it early or, you know, 10, 15 years ago is because you could say, hey, UConn's just going to win this game by 30. You know, they're going to be in the final four and then we can start watching. Uh, and that's how you grow the game is when, when the talent starts to spread out um, and I, I think to your point that you mentioned, um, at times, you know, there's, there's players that stay in, in the men's game for, for four years, five years. But at, at times, people don't know the men's players as well because it, it, feel, you know, it feels like they, 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 they rotate a little bit more. I mean, Caitlin Clark, Gabby Marshall, Kate Martin. Kate Martin's in her sixth year at Iowa. Uh, yeah. Caitlin's in her fourth year. Gabby's in her fifth year. You know who 
those players are. You've watched them for several years. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would say you get to know them, but, but you know, all these teams and it's not, Oh, who's this freshman playing for Kentucky. And then the next year it's like, Oh, this is a new freshman playing for Kentucky. You just don't know the players. And I think that's where the women's game has really, really helped them. Is you get to see these star players for, for more than one year. It's three, four with the COVID year. Sometimes it's five years. Yeah, exactly. And, and do you think about what is Cleveland going to be like? Cause you're going to have Iowa and they travel great. UConn has a, a very big traveling contingent with the women's team. Now they've got split because their men's team's in the final four as well. NC State has the men's and the women's teams in the final four. So they may split up a little bit, but South Carolina has a rabid, like sells their arena out every game. Cleveland's going to be crazy. Yeah. And, and, you know, speaking from my experiences last year, Iowa fans really traveled to Seattle. They really traveled to Albany this year. They really traveled to Dallas as well. Uh, so I don't think there's going to be any issue with Iowa fans getting to Cleveland. They're going to show up. Um, it will be interesting, though, but to your point. I, it, it's not very often. I, I'd be curious the last time where, you know, NC State and UConn, you know, having their men's and women's teams. That fe- seems pretty uh, uh, rare to have that happen. Yeah, so U- UConn, because of Jim Calhoun and Gino Ariema, I think had it a few times. But it's it's not normal. And it's definitely not normal at NC State. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be a fun weekend of, of hoops on on men's and women's side. Uh, Kyle, have fun. That that sounds like a, a crazy event. And uh, what a ride you've gotten to cover. Yeah, I mean, I, I this is my third year covering Iowa with, with Caitlin Clark. And, um, you know, just as an observer of the game, just watching, you know, women's college basketball the last two years, you know, Iowa winning last night means that I get another chance to watch Caitlin, watch this team play. Uh, they're so fun to watch. And it, it's just one of those where, you know, when they lose or if they win the national title then it's over um you know caitlin will move on to the wmba gabby will move on kate will move on and there'll be no more of this iowa team so um getting to see them another time in the final four again it's gonna be fantastic it's been it's been really fun to watch this team um you know seeing the the publicity that caitlin's got and and for me to be kind of you know up close and watch it and and talk to her a lot and you know see her for weekly media abilities thing like that um, I've been really close to it, and I've been really fortunate to be able to cover what I think is is the best player to ever play women's college basketball. All right. I think you're going to have a lot of people who agree with you. Kyle Huseman from the Hawkeye Report, thank you so much. Have a safe trip home from Albany. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.